understand. You can turn your Bibles to Philippians 4 while I try to find my lesson. Plan. to say this evening. Um, may it be everything that you want me to say. Uh, I pray that everything would be taken to heart and be used in all, all our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to talk about five keys to peace, but you might notice that peace has little things called periods in between each individual letter. I created this acronym. Now I'm going to be completely honest with you. I came up with this acronym at like 4 p.m. in the afternoon. It was an epiphany. I hadn't done any thinking about it. I knew that I was going to talk about this passage, and then, bam, I just thought of it, and I was kind of proud of myself. But regardless, we're going to fill in the acronym as we go this evening. I only have about 30 minutes to talk, but Dennis said, and my he's an experienced teacher, he said the fastest he'd be able to teach the material that I put in my paper in an hour. So I'm going to have to cut some and talk really fast. I apologize. Hopefully you don't fall asleep. And if you do, the couches outside are real comfortable. Anyway. <laughs> we're going to talk about the end of the book of Philippians. And the end of Philippians is filled with a lot of Bible verses that we probably all know individually, but we probably haven't figured out that they're all together. I don't know about you, but about six months ago, I realized that all of these verses that I had heard many times before were all in one chapter together. We're going to get to them later. You're going to recognize them, but I just wanted to point that out. So the Philippians were a church that Paul um, had created on his first missionary journey. Philippi was a town created by the king of Macedonia when he went and conquered the world. But Paul went over and he created a church in Philippi. And they were a group of people that were obeying what God wanted them to do. And the book of Philippians is actually a big thank you note. It's a really long thank you note. But that's what, on two occasions, and Paul wanted to express his sympathies for that. He's writing it from prison. Like most of the epistles, he's in prison. Which is unfortunate for Paul, but we'll get to unfortunate circumstances when it comes to peace in just a little bit. All right. Before I go into detail about what the passage says about peace and what the Bible says about peace, I'm just going to define it for you in general. It's freedom from disturbance, quiet tranquility, freedom from war or violence. These are all obvious things. You're probably all rolling your eyes. Mental calm, serenity. Peace isn't very tangible or substantial. Is it? You can't, like, touch it. And it's actually kind of abstract because it's the absence of something. Peace isn't something that you can go and get. It's something that you, uh, like, you're able to attain through the absence of something else. Like if we're in a war and there's no longer war, there's an absence of war. Therefore, we are in peace. Um, in the definitions that I gave, it talked about freedom. So it's not merely the absence of bad things. It's the liberty from evil. So sin entered this world when Adam and Eve sinned, and therefore we have evil in this world. Everyone knows that our fleshly bodies don't naturally want to do the right thing, correct? We don't naturally want to do the right thing. So it, peace is the liberty from evil. I, I encourage you to think about that. The very first blank on your paper is pray. Yes, it sounds cliche, but I have a lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to praying in peace. So please just bear with me. Go ahead and fill in pray there. So if you are in Philippians, could I have somebody read verses 6 and 7 from Philippians 4? Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Someone can just stand up and start reading it. Hopefully you're loud. Do not be anxious about everything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Okay, how many of you have heard that before? How many of you knew that I was going to quote that verse when I said, you must pray to have peace? Oh, okay, some people? Anyway, so 
So if you go back into verse 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. When it says that, it's not saying that we should live carefree and we shouldn't really care what we're going out and doing. We shouldn't live as we want to. It's saying that um, we should do everything that goes on. It says um, to care and be genuinely concerned is one thing. But to worry is something else. It then talks about peace in verse 7. And the peace of God. What is the peace of God? Can someone tell me what the peace of God is? Well, I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> There's a Greek word. It's irene. Now, I know I have a podium, and I know I just quoted from the Greek, but I am not a pastor, I promise. Irene means to convey a range of meanings. It's including, like, well-being, prosperity, freedom from anxiety. There's the word freedom again. Safety from harm and deliverance from enemies. So that one word gave a bunch of different examples of peace. So it's saying that if we have prayer, then we have peace. Does it say that we're not going to have the problems? No. It says we're going to have peace. I'm going to quote Matthew 6, 25 through 23. Jesus discusses worrying on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to read the whole passage because it's a little bit lengthy. But he says, For this reason I say to you, this is Jesus talking, Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for the body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body not more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more worthy than they? The Bible says not to worry. And when the Bible says be anxious for nothing, we are to care and be genuinely concerned, but we don't need to worry. A main point that I want to drive is that peace relieves stress and removes the mess. If anything that you remember when I talk about peace is the answer, it's going to relieve stress and remove the mess. Why turn to God, sorry, why turn to something else when you can give, um, get peace from God? The next thing I want to talk about is the A. It's acknowledge what you've been given. Can someone please read Philippians 4, 10 through 13? Or I can read it. I'll read it. That's fine. <clears throat> but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. This is talking about how the Philippians helped Paul by giving him something that he needed. It goes on to say, not that I speak from want, for but I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means and also how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everyone knows that first, right? Did you know it was in the same passage as the other one? I didn't know that. And if you did, congratulations, because I didn't. So the situation Paul was in wasn't good. He was in jail, and um, he was glad to receive stuff from the Philippians prior to his um, imprisonment. But he wasn't doing so well, and the Philippians gave him something he needed. But he said that he was able to live peacefully even if he didn't have stuff that we want. How often, this is not a rhetorical question, how often do we not get something we want, and then we either get a little upset, uptight, or frustrated? Raise your hands, anybody? Like, for instance, you ask for something for Christmas, and then your parents, it's a big misunderstanding, and you get the wrong thing. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's terrible. I'd like to tell you that God's got it. Everything is going to be okay. I'm going to talk about this guy named George Mueller. He was a missionary, and he was in charge of an orphanage. If you've heard this story before, please don't tune me out, because I still would like to make my point, even if you're not paying attention. George Mueller had an orphanage, but he wasn't doing so well one morning. He realized he didn't have anything to give the children for breakfast, nor any milk to drink. He was still peaceful about it. He obviously knew what God said. He knew what he had. He knew that he had all of these children. He knew that he had God. And he prayed, like we read earlier in Philippians 4, still talking about peace. And there was this guy who bakes bread. I think he's a baker. And he had some extra bread. Now, how many of you like old bread? You love to eat old bread. Okay, I wasn't expecting you. <laughs> old bread is crunchy, and it grows mold, and it's not very good. 
it's not croutons if it has mold. <laughs> so basically, the baker had to get rid of this bread because he had sold to everyone that wanted to buy bread that morning, and he didn't want to take it home because he didn't need it. He was just going to give it to his pigs. So his truck breaks down in front of the orphanage who is in need of bread. No, not a coincidence, guys. That was Jesus. <laughs> Same thing happened with the milk guy. How many of you like spoiled milk? How many of you like curded milk? I'm not talking about cottage cheese. I'm talking about milk you intended to drink, and now it's curdy. I like cottage cheese, but some people are so repulsed by it. <laughs> Regardless, the guy had to get rid of the milk, and guess where his truck broke down? Right in front of the orphanage. George Mueller had faith and he had peace that God would handle the situation. The kids didn't go hungry that day. And I'd like to say it again. Peace relieves stress and removes the mess. Say it with me. Peace relieves stress and removes the mess. And I'll say it by myself. I lost it. That's embarrassing. Never mind. <laughs> I'd like to now talk about C. Go ahead and put the word censor, C-E-N-S-O-R. You guys are probably thinking of the FCC and how they beep out bad words when people accidentally cuss on live television or something like that. When I say censor, I'm talking about censoring your thoughts. From Philippians 4, can anybody please read verse 8? Or if anyone has it memorized? No? Riley, go ahead and read verse 8, please. Nice and not though, okay. Technology page. My Bible doesn't have to load. <laughs> so there are a lot of adjectives in there. Why on earth does it help to think positively? To think what is true, what is honorable, what is right, pure, lovely, um, as well as of good repute and excellence. Why do that? What does it do? I say that the absence of negativity in one's thoughts can provoke such an um, abs... I, that's weird. I thought I typed something there. Regardless, I'm going to talk about some of the words, the adjectives. <coughs> Honorable means worthy of respect. If we're not thinking something that's respectful, and we're not going to want to say that thing, why should we think it? There's multiple times when someone says something really obnoxious to me, and I obviously am going to think something not very respectful to them, and I might roll them my eyes because I don't want to say something that would make them want to hate me forever. But it's called sarcasm. I'm a sarcastic person, but people don't understand when I do sarcastic, and it's really bad. So think of things that are respectful. That's what honorable means there. I want to talk about the word lovely. When I thought of lovely, I'm like, what thoughts... I mean, there are some lovely thoughts out there, but I'm like, what does the word lovely actually mean when it comes to thoughts? I thought that was really abstract. So the Greek word that was used here, because for those that don't know, the Bible wasn't written in English. <laughs> it was written, at least this book was written in the Greek. So if we want to actually try to figure out what Paul meant, we should kind of look up the Greek word. What? Anyway, so that's why pastors quote from the Greek, if you didn't know. Also an epiphany I had just a little bit ago. So it's prosphilia. That is the word that in Greek that means lovely. It's lovable and gracious, winesome, which means attractive or appealing. That doesn't necessarily mean lust, by the way. Just wanted to make that clear. Um, and also promoting peace. That's an interesting word, peace. It's kind of like I'm teaching on that. All right. So I said, why does this help? The absence of negativity in someone's life is then able to bring about positivity. How many of you are optimists most of the time? How many of you are pessimists? How many of you are realists? Oh, you guys didn't know I was going to make that an option, did you? Yeah, so some people see the glasses half full, some people see this half empty. And if you take away the negativity, then your thoughts won't be negative, and your thoughts are going to be more true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent. If you censor your thoughts, you'll have peace. And peace relieves the stress and removes 
the mass. I'm going to talk about E. The first or the second? The second one. Okay. Did we already talk about the first E? No. Yeah. I think my page is stuck together. <laughs> oh, that's really awkward. <laughs> it's all right. Dennis, I printed it double-sided, but I thought that it was single-sided. <laughs> Let's skip over to the first E. No wonder you guys were giggling. Someone should have just told me for heaven's sake. We're going to go over the ones that I forgot. No wonder. I, I thought that, like, Dennis told me I was going to go long, and I've only been up here for 15 minutes. No wonder. <clears throat> the first E is enrich yourself in God's work. And I like to think that comes from Philippians 4 9, but more importantly, after studying, that's what God was saying. So, could someone please read Philippians 4 9? Dennis, it's really awkward when you don't want people to read. And it's like up here and you're waiting. And I see why you call on me every single time. Oh my goodness. Call and tell somebody. Well, it's okay. Matthew raises his hand. So, Paul is talking from himself. He's not quoting God. Um, Jesus is the only one that can quote God because he is God, but it says the things you have heard and received and heard in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul is a living testament, a living example. Can we please turn to Philippians 1, verse 1? We need to figure out who Paul is before we decide that Paul is telling these people, live like I do. We can't do that unless we know what Paul says. I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. Okay, case closed. We know what Paul is doing. He's a bondservant of Christ. A servant is someone who submits to a master, the master being God, doing what God says. Therefore, Paul is telling the Philippians to be like himself. He's acting like God. Therefore, the Philippians are going to be acting like God. Yes, okay, thank you. So... In Psalm 23, 1 through 4, it talks about the Lord being our shepherd. And it kind of talks about discipline and the Lord steering us one way or steering us the other way, doing right things, doing wrong things, and how we're still comfortable in that. Could someone please... Actually, I'm just going to read it to save time. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When you think of a rod and a staff, do you think pleasant thoughts, or do you think like someone being beaten? I think, well, in a shepherd's point of view, because David wrote this, what were the rod and the staff used for? They weren't for hurting people. But why would they do that? To keep them in line? What does it mean to keep someone in line? My mom says that to me all the time. Does anyone have a... I said it earlier. It starts with the D ends with a discipline. <clears throat> discipline. <laughs> yeah. So God gives us discipline. He gives us the right, and he gives us only the right. Even if we go this way... He has this rod and he has this staff. And if we believe in him and we want to do what he has said to do, he will then bring us back. That should give us peace. Because if we go down a slippery slope, then it's really not good. I mean, at the end of slippery slopes, I think of ponds, I think of drowning, I think of death. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> We're going to go to A. A is acknowledge what you have been given. Oh, no. We're going to go to the last E. This is a disaster. All because I double-sided my notes. Holy moly. You were kidding? I was comforting you. Thank you. So before I before I talk about um, E, we need to look at the beginning of Philippians four. Probably like three times a year, Barry Pearson will do this, but I figured I'd do it. Could someone please read Philippians 4 1? Do I 
you, Cole. Okay, go ahead, Olivia. All right. Hold on one second. Uh, my Bible doesn't have to load. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one four. Yes. No, no, no. Four one. Did someone else do it? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Therefore, can someone? Everyone, say it with me. What's the therefore, therefore? I had to do it at least once. It's one of my favorites. So this is the beginning of the chapter, and it says, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? We're going to turn to chapter 3. I'm going to read from chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Am I not reading anymore? I'm sorry. I appreciate your enthusiasm. It says, Brethren, join, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk with whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. That's kind of what I was talking about, going down a slippery slope, doing things that God doesn't want us to do. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has given to subject all things to himself. The important verse is the first couple ones. It talks about following Paul's example once more. The E is envelop yourself in godly people. It's spelled like envelope, but it's pronounced envelop. It basically means to cover and surround yourself. You guys might wonder why I'm not just going in order of chapter four. I had this really cool, um, I had this really cool thing, this acronym. But guess what? I didn't go in order of the acronym either, so it doesn't really matter. We're just not going in order at all. I'd like to give an example in the Bible of the Old Testament kings. Before I do that, I have to tell the story of Joseph. So basically what happened, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to tell the story of Joseph. Most of you don't remember that. Never mind. I remember it. Okay, so in the Old Testament, there were some kings. Israel wasn't supposed to have a king. They were supposed to have judges, but they all wanted a king. They whined and whined and whined. We want to be like everybody else. They didn't want to be what God wanted. They wanted to do what everyone else wanted. That's where it all started. So then God says, okay, you can have a king. They give him Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then there's this schism. It's a fancy word for split. And there's a line drawn right down the middle of the... Actually, if this is north, this is south. It's right here. So there's two kingdoms that are going on. In the north, there were no good kings. They were all bad. In fact, almost every king was killed by their successor. Not their son, their general. So basically, almost every kingdom ended with a coup. In the south, there were a few good kings. There were a few good kings who abolished the idolatry, especially the stuff that was going on up in the north. Some of the people in the north got thrown out of windows, eaten by dogs. Those people were not good people, and therefore God poured out his wrath upon them. The important thing is people followed the examples of the kings and the entirety of the nation paid the price when the neighboring nations like the Philistines or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Moabites or the Hittites or those people came and conquered them, enslaved them, and did terrible things to them. I won't go into detail, but you can read First and Second Kings if you'd like to see some of the stuff that those nations did. The Assyrians were the worst. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. <clears throat> you become the people that you hang out with. I want to point to Proverbs. We've been going through Proverbs recently. Proverbs 13.20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. If we envelop ourselves with godly people and people that want to follow the example of God, do what Paul is saying in this very passage, then we probably will act like them. It's cliche, I know. You become who you hang out with. You've probably been told that multiple times. You guys are going through... Adolescents, your parents probably say that all the time. But the easiest proof I can give you of this existence is sarcasm. I mentioned sarcasm earlier. How many of you are sarcastic all the time? Never. 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 I didn't do that <laughs> Keep your hands up if your friends are also sarcastic. No, 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 no. I meant if keep your hands up. Not a lot of people's hands went down. See what I mean? You become who you hang out with, or you are. This also has to do with peer pressure. I have a little story. It's not a personal story, I'm sorry. It's not even about a human. It's actually about a fly. 
like those little bugs that are really slow in the winter and easy to catch, and then in the summer they're just really fast little boogers. You can't get them. <laughs> if you want to know why that happens, just ask your biology teacher. Mine told me it was very fascinating. <laughs> but that's besides the point. I want to talk about this fly. So he sees this really big spider web. Now flies don't like spider webs because they get caught in them and then they get just eaten by a spider. It's not a very nice death. The spider drains them of their blood and then they die very slowly. It's actually pretty terrible. So the fly didn't want to fly into there, but he sees a bunch of his fly friends down on the floor. They're having a big party on a wonderful yellow piece of paper. Come down here and hang out with us. We're having a great time, we just can't leave. <laughs> it's so wonderful, we don't want to go. The fly flew down there and had a great time on the fly paper where he died. A very similarly slow death. There is a toxin embedded in that paper that penetrates into the fly and kills them. <laughs> no! <laughs> So that's peer pressure for him. If that fly would have not listened to the people that made the bad decision, would he have made the bad decision? The answer is no. You are who you hang out with. What does that have to do with peace? How many of you, when you, this is kind of an abstract question, how many of you feel peaceful when you come to church on Sunday? A lot of people that come to church have a really similar mindset. <clears throat> Either you came here because your parents made you come here, or you came here because you want to worship God. A lot of the people here in Fellowship Bible Church want to learn about the Bible, and learn about what the Bible has to say, and what the Bible says to do. And all these people are positive influences on us. I don't know about you, but I feel peaceful when I come hang out, hang out at church. If I go into a situation where I don't necessarily know the people, I don't necessarily have as much peace. That's just me. People who care for what God's word says and are actively trying to love according to his will, it'll bring peace to you. And I'd like to remind you that peace is the absence of turmoil. If you find yourself in a situation of turmoil, ask who you're going through the situation with. Maybe that has to do something with it. I'm not saying we shouldn't be friends with people who don't know God. How else are they supposed to learn about him? But at the same time, if you're struggling with peace, Maybe you should also find some Christian friends. Just a question. So, did I get through all five of the letters successfully? Yes! Yeah! 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 I'm not finished yet. It was a question. But did we get through all five? Can we go through them together, please? If I can find the very... This is a very disorganized lesson. I apologize. It's a change for you, though, because Dennis actually knows what he's doing most of the time. It's not like I'm a senior in high school and he's an adult, but... Really old, dude. He's an adult. <clears throat> nice. That was it. I've only been up here for 25 minutes. So the P stands for pray. The E stands for enrich. The A stands for acknowledge. The C stands for censor. And the E stands for envelop. If you say envelope, no one's going to judge you, but you just don't have the right definition. <laughs> I'd like to point out that, again, I said at the beginning, the world isn't peaceful on its own. This is an interesting quote, and it's kind of important, actually. Peace is the glorious moment in history when everyone stands around reloading. That has to do with war. It's proof that the world is not going to be peaceful on its own. We can't naturally find peace. We can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to have a peaceful day today. How many of you have been successful in waking up saying that I'm going to be peaceful and you were successful? Hopefully you had God on your side or my entire lesson just went out the window. <laughs> the world is not peaceful on its own and I would encourage everybody to see what God has to say about it. You can pray to him. You can see what he has to say by enriching his word in your lives. You can acknowledge what you have already and stop worrying about what you don't have. There's a little hint. You could censor what you think. If you're thinking negatively all the time, that's how you're always going to think. It's like a slippery slope. You think one negative thought, and it's kind of hard to think positively because you just keep getting worked up. How many people, when they get mad, or they've seen someone do this, my dad does this, and I think a lot of people's um, 
parents that do this as adolescents, that's what we see. But they get mad, and then they keep getting mad, and they get more mad. And we've understood their point, but they just continue to get more and more mad. Even though we're sitting in the corner, I don't cry. <laughs> I'm sitting in the corner, like... We understand, but they're just still mad because they've gone down this road where their thought process is just getting stronger and they can't really get off of it. Our minds do the exact same thing with negative thoughts. So censor your thoughts. And then envelop yourself with people that want to do what God wants you to do. If you do those things, I hope you can find peace. That's going to be my goal. I'm going to college. I'm stressed out. How many of you are stressed out? You don't have to be going to college. You don't have to be a senior in high school. You don't have to be involved in a bajillion activities. You don't even have to have homework every night. How many of you are stressed out? This world demands so much more of young people than it has ever in the past. Can I get an amen? Amen! We are expected to do so much more than young people ever were expected to. But then at the same time, while we're expected to do a lot more, should we then be seeking God's help more? I don't know, food for thought. God provides peace for the weary. So if you give your life to Him and trust His plan, you'll then be able to have peace in any and every situation. That was a quote from Philippians, you know, the thing I just talked about for about 30 minutes. There are some discussion questions at the bottom of your paper that you got. Yes, they're cheesy. Yes, they probably are really open-ended. But I hope they aren't all that you talk about when you go to small groups for the next 10, 15 minutes. I hope that you're able to have a deeper discussion. I want you to talk about um, peace in general, peace in your own life, where you've struggled with finding peace. Maybe where you've had a success in finding peace. What are some other ways besides the five that Cole came up when he had an epiphany one Sunday afternoon? Um, what are some other ways that you can attain peace through God's work? And if anyone else has another place in the Bible that talks about peace, that's wonderful. But before I leave, I'd like everybody to know that peace relieves stress and removes the mess. If you don't remember anything except for that, I would be happy. Because why turn to something else when God can give you peace? Don't turn to anything else. Turn to God. Let's pray. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for helping me stumble through this lesson going out of order, even though I was already going out of order. It was like a Double out of order, two negatives equal a positive, amen. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. I pray that people would understand what Philippians has to say, what you have to say about peace and how it affects our lives positively. Um, may you give us peace the rest of the school year and the rest of our lives. May we seek it from the right avenues, not from the world, but from you. Um, and from your heavenly, uh, it's from your son that loved us. In your son's name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you.